Hey there, I'm Ange Robertson. And I'm Jacob Payne, and you're tuned in for another episode of Showreel. And with us this week is Daryl Plumridge. He's an accomplished actor and director with over 70 performances under his belt. And we're also reviewing three films, 20 Feet from Stardom, The Invisible Woman, and a student film, Beautiful Girl. So don't touch that remote. Welcome back to Showreel. So our guest host today has done plenty of short films and plays and commercials and many more. So today we welcome the one and only Daryl Plumridge. Hi Daryl. Thank you Ange. Jacob. Nice to have you on. Thank so Daryl, tell us, how did it all begin? Oh well, I guess it started when I was about 20. I saw an ad in the local paper down at Sunnybank for uh, a play. So I thought I'd go along and audition. It's something I always wanted to do. but sort of sport and life got in the way and uh, got the role and uh, yeah then I got transferred up to Rocky, got another role up there and got transferred back to Brisbane so I missed out on both of those and then uh, just started again back in Brisbane and did about 20 plays. Okay and then when did you move into directing? Uh, to, well first of all I guess I started in film, I started doing a few uni student films and things like that and that just grew and grew and grew I guess um, and then uh, directing was my first directorial, well I did a small one on, on the Wilkinsons mm. uh, with Jacob here uh, about two years ago but really my first real directing on my own was last year with Impact. Okay. And Impact's a show about uh, one punch can kill so it was something that I was um, pretty passionate about. So. Is that the coward punch we're talking about? Basically what they call the coward punch now, yep. Mm. So, um, and yeah, it turned out to be a pretty good little short and uh, so we've just got that out into the festival run at the moment. All right, what, what other films are you working on? Uh, I've just finished on uh, Charlie's Farm, which I guess is a, a, a big buzz around the Queensland independent circuit at the moment with actors like Tara Reid and Bill Moseley uh, from Texas Chainsaw Massacre and Kane Hodder. Kane Hodder's actually killed more individual people in movies than any other actor in the world. So, That's uh, a claim to fame. It's a big claim to fame. So, uh, <coughs> yeah, he was Jason Voorhees in, uh, in Friday the 13th. Okay. Yeah. I so. guess Danny Trejo is probably trying to catch up to him at the moment. Yeah, but. that's right. Yep. Um, Tara Reid, what can you tell us? Uh, she's skinny. Wow, that's good, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I have signed an NDA, so there's not much I can talk oh, really? about with Daddy's little girl. Uh, with that uh, Charlie's farm. Her hair? Uh, yeah, her hair was lustrous. That's Beautiful. Right. She's that's quite right. a good-looking young lady for her. And a fine her, actress. And a mm. fine actress. So, yes. so is there anything that you can tell us about Charlie's farm? That Ah, uh, look, it's um, it's a basically uh, an '80s slasher type horror film. Um, mm. So a lot of lot of death. Um, it's basically about a few backpackers go out to uh, Charlie's farm, which is basically rumoured that there was a massacre of the family there a few years before, and um, so all these backpackers go out there and uh, tend not to come back. Yeah, that old. But trip. a few survive, Just and obviously that's go. why the rumour keeps thing. going. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. who is Tara Re? Is she? She's one of the backpackers. Really? Yes. A mature age backpacker. Mature age backpacker. Well, good for her. Yeah. 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 Okay. And just going back a bit in terms of your acting. Yep. Do you, if you knew now what you knew then, would you have pursued this path of acting oh, and films? Absolutely. And I love it. I yeah. love it. In fact, I probably would have pursued it a, a little bit harder and I would have gone to, because I've never done a, an acting lesson, so I would have probably gone to a school and, and actually learned how to act so I can actually be a proper actor. So you can say, I am an actor. I am an actor, mm. yeah. Mm. Someone should have warned us. Yeah. Ah. So, uh, no, absolutely. I probably would have got it into it, into it a little bit earlier and, um, and, and probably more full on. Like, I, I did theatre because I enjoyed it. Uh, and then theatre got a little bit hard with having four children, so yeah. I moved into film. Um, but if I had have known what I knew now, I would have certainly got into it a lot earlier. Mm. Yeah. What's been a, like the, the biggest surprise or challenge for you in changing from acting to directing? What have you noticed? Oh, look, I, I think the biggest thing is that directing is, is just full on. Like it's, you know, three months beforehand, th on a short, three months beforehand and three months after. Um, I mean, on a feature film, it's, it's, it's even worse. And I've got my first feature film 
I'm directing the trailer called Long Shadows coming up, uh, mm. and I may or may not direct the feature based on time. Being a full-time worker, it's uh, it's sometimes hard to fit that in. But yeah, I, I think if if I'd been born, you know, only 20 years ago, I probably would have been diagnosed with ADHD or something mm. because I, I enjoy acting, but directing t- just it's a long, long process. Mm. Um, enjoyable, but it's a long process. You yeah, don't get to just pop in and do yeah, pop in, and do your stuff. And and thank you. See ya. Yeah, exactly. yeah, it's definitely I mean, ADD. Yeah. Acting can be challenging, <laughs> but when you're a director, especially on low budget stuff, you've got to control everything. You've got to keep your eye on it all. Yeah, know? a lot of responsibility, and I'm mm. a 50 year old kid, so mm. yeah, it's um, it's probably. I'm yet, uh, I'm yet to meet a 50 year old adult, so Good. don't don't worry. Good to no. see. You. <laughs> um, so why do you think, like if you, like you said, you didn't have that formal thing, yep. do you think that that makes it a lot harder if you don't have a bit of a network or sort of learn those tricks of how to get work? Because yeah. a lot of it, I think, is it is that who you know and... and Correct. Acting's all about networking, without, mm. without a doubt. I mean, I'm not a professional networker, but I see naturally, because I've done a, a lot of films, I know a lot of people. Yeah. And then they just ask you to do another film and yeah. they ask you... And, you know, there's not a lot of fat 50-year-old actors around, so, I, I, you know, it, it comes Plum pretty easy. That's right, the roles are there. So, <laughs> um, yeah, I think it's, um, it's certainly been interesting, interesting journey, mm. there's no doubt about mm. that. And I think the bit of paper certainly helps if you want to take it up into the next level I, I think that's a it's a better ticket in yeah um but also i've done a lot of films now so i think i've you know really i've done it probably the hard way but i think um i've learned more mm. than most students would learn so probably in starting years. out you may have been a bit more isolated in what you were trying to do yeah. but now that you have those Thing, that basically becomes your CV, doesn't Correct. it? Your show, really. Absolutely. So, yeah. Yeah. So it's really you can't you can't count for experience. Experience always yeah. wins out. There, so really, just get out there and try and get the roles and keep acting. Yeah, I guess one of the things, one of the bits of advice I'd give to any young actor now is to say yes to everything because mm. you know you, even when you get a role that you don't think is going to be great, there's so many people that you meet on every role on every film set that. You know, that, that person, that young runner that's on that film may be the next Steven Spielberg. Mm. And I've had films where I've, uh, you know, I've, I've been on a pretty ordinary film, but one of the guys was writing a film and he wrote a part for me and, and now he's doing a $10 million film called Break the Rock. Yeah. So, uh, and, and obviously I'm jumping on his coattails. Yeah. So. Well, it can happen quite quickly, can't it? Yes. You know, that's what exactly. I've always said. It's like, well... Be nice to everyone because that runner is maybe employing you Absolutely. in your next Absolutely, and that's the advice I give: is say yes to everyone, ev- everything, and and be nice to everyone because mm. you just and 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 you know, mean it. Yeah, yeah. Probably not bad life philosophy, really. No, exactly. <laughs> All right, Darren, well, you're going to stick with us, and it's time for an ad break now. But we'll be back shortly, so stay tuned. <laughs> Welcome back to Showreel. It's that time again to review a couple of recent feature films. Let's take a look at the trailer for the first one, 20 Feet to Stardom. Seeing background remains a, I suppose, a somewhat unheralded position. You know. There's a power to these women that stand on stage with these guys. It's a bit of a walk. That walk to the front is, is complicated. Off the radio. How could you logically not have a diva have her music on? I, I don't get that. All right, so the film it uses like the, the, these women that uh, were the the backup singers for all of these great you know songs, the classics, and and the, the film is basically a bunch of clips of all of these women, little bios, and talking about their history and how they how they uh, created the sounds of these songs, which are now iconic, and um, how some of them like the the backup singers, no one really pays that much attention and it, all of the focus is on the main guy, but they're 20 feet away and the film 20 feet to stardom is that 20 feet walk, which that. can be very difficult for some of these women to do, even when they get the opportunity. Um, so the, the film basically, because of their great voices and you hear them singing and talking and, and that's what supports the film, makes it enjoyable. But it's not a film that has like a strong sort of narrative through it. It's just telling you all of these stories about them all. It's obviously done very well by its uh, selections in quite a few uh, festivals there. 
yeah, yeah. Well, I, I don't know that I would have given it an award, an award myself, but um, it was enjoyable. But enjoyable in the sense that you could watch um, a whole bunch of great video clips, and that would be enjoyable to watch. You know, great songs, nice video clips. N not enjoyable in the sense of watching, I, I don't know, like. A, a musical like Les Mis or something like that. So is it shot as a, as a film or as a documentary? It's a documentary, yep. yeah. yeah. Okay. But so um, how do they, do they cut back and forth between, or is it kind of just a series of, um, of women? Is it, is it just sort of, well, it, it's, how is it linked? How, do they, how well, are they linked? They, they have a lot of interviews with all of the, the you know, like uh, Bruce Springsteen and Sting and uh, Bette Midler and all of these people, as well as the women themselves and the women that sung with them. And that they have a lot of archival footage of, like, say, David Bowie um, talking with his his um, backup singers and, and organising the song, arranging it. Um, I guess it's an interesting premise in in how many people that have got the talent just can't take that that yeah. step to to become stars themselves. Well, there, one lady in particular, um, I can't remember the, the, a lot of their names of so many so many of the, of these singers, but she she has had a successful um, solo career, but she just likes being a backup singer. She doesn't want the pressure, and she doesn't. She likes the anonymity of, of mm. being a backup singer, um, but she's got a, a, a fantastic voice, and no doubt she could be a, a, you know, one of the, the the big famous singers that you hear about. Do they well, get, I guess it's do like they get the, paid well. And yeah, do they get paid well? <laughs> uh, it's a good job. Yeah, I, I'm, well, it's, I, I guess it's a good job. They travel around the world, and you know, at certain points, um, like Darlene Love. Um, with the, the Blossoms, they were like the first ones. They took over, before that it was all white girls singing, you know, mm. which was a completely different style. Um, and they had as much work as they wanted and they couldn't actually do all of the jobs that they were asked for. So yeah. was it worth watching? Yeah, it was enjoyable. Yep. I mean, based on, because they're talented singers, you know. Rating? But I'd give it three out of five. Yeah, yeah sounds quite generous. <laughs> and can you sing a song? Can I sing a song? From the movie? Yeah. Um, and you do what? Yeah, I'll, I'll spare you. Okay. How's that? Have you seen anyway. the film, Daryl, at all? No, I haven't. But no. uh, yeah, I'm not. I'm not a big documentary watcher. Mm. In fact, I hardly ever get to the movies at all. Really. Yeah. <laughs> Too busy. Yes. Yes. All right. So our second feature film for this week is The Invisible Woman. Let's check out the trailer. Mr. Dickens. Mr. Dickens. You are an admirer of my husband's work? At the moment, I'm lost in Little Dorrit. Do you love him? He's married. That has not stopped him falling in love with you. You are part of my existence. Part of the little good in me. Part of the evil. What is it that we are? The Invisible Woman. Only in cinemas. Okay, so I went along and saw The Invisible Woman, which is in the cinemas now. Uh, it's a very much in the period piece genre. It's basically about Charles Dickens and his affair with an 18-year-old. So it, it's sort of been glossed over that, oh, an 18-year-old, is that kind of a predatory thing? Da, da, da. That wasn't really addressed in the film because I actually don't think it's that relevant. How old but, was Dickens at the time? Four, um, 43 or something. Um, this is but, back in a time where it was probably not that uncommon for people well, to marry the 13 year old cousins or something. Yeah, I think, yeah, he, w he was married, so that's probably more of the, and that is basically the plot of the film. It's like, even though, so he was, he was married, but the secret, even though his wife and he separated later, um, the mistress, uh, Nellie Turnan, still had to remain anonymous and so, hidden, and, and she was as he says in the film, her, you know, his secret. When I heard it, I thought it might have been the invisible man, but as a woman, but yeah, obviously no, not. Yeah, so she, she's invisible and basically lives her life, well, her time with him, because she actually marries and becomes a school teacher and a mother, and, and this is in, it's in a flashback format. So the invisible means that she's never seen by anyone, Yes, she's she hidden. can't really exist she's in yep. his world. Um, and Dickens' wife, uh, Catherine, does know about um, the affair, and in fact comes to her house and gives said, oh, this was wrongly delivered to me, this, this piece of jewellery, and it was meant to go to you. And so here I'm bringing it to you. And then she says, you know, Charles insisted that I bring this to you. So it's also about how his cruelty, really, that while she, he kept her in his life, 
she still didn't really have a lot of status. Um, so it's fairly, it's based on um, a biography, uh, it's a book called The Invisible Woman, which is the story of Nellie Turner and, and Charles Dickens, um, written by Claire Tomlin, she's a journalist and biographer. Um, so it does, it, the affair is, um, there's not much known about it because both Dickens and Nellie destroyed their letters, okay. which mentioned it at all, So, which does provide an opportunity for artistic license. But mm. really, they don't go there. And it's quite a miserable, it seems like well, you were, you know, with this man until he died, yet you seem to all be having a really glum time. Okay. Did so it win any awards? It won, it was nominated for an Academy Award for Best Costumes. Oh. So it's beautiful. Ray Fiennes is Dickens and also directs it. Um, you know, so it's, it's all very stunning. And if you're a fan of Dickens or period dramas in general, you, you know, you'll lap it up, you'll love it. Um, but if you, it, it's not overly compelling and I don't think it actually is that big a story for those times. Mm. So I, I, I gave it a three though. A three? Yeah. Okay. It's feeling generous. So. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so uh, we're gonna take a break, but we'll be right back. Our local short film this week is Beautiful Girl by Ethan Scott. Let's take a look. Where's my ribbon? Give it here or I'll tell. I felt you touch my hair, I know you took it, you always take my stuff. What?
I am the beautiful girl. What'd you make of that? Um, I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> hey, well, I, it was mildly creepy, I think we could safely say. Yeah, well, I'm not sure exactly what they were saying at the end there. Um, I guess cross-dressing starts young. Well, I, I guess it's questioning, like you think that he's being creepy because he likes her and then yeah. obviously at the end it's completely different. He just wants to be like her. Yeah. Um, which is, I guess is an interesting sort of it is. look so at it. So he's just acquiring her femininity through those objects. Mm. Correct. So well, rather than looking at her as as something that he likes, it's, that, yeah, that he's looking at her as something he wants to be. Mm. Mm. Yeah, mm. Which is, I guess that little twist at the end was interesting. Because mm. I didn't expect it. Yeah. No. I mean, uh, I guess looking at the technicality of how they shot it, I mean, there was a lot of deliberate, obviously, lens flare from the sun and whatever else, and, you know, but... It is a student film, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. The, the, the shot, shot choices and stuff weren't too bad. Yep. And it was quite brave in its simplicity. Especially for how short it was. I yes. Know, it was a couple of minutes. Mm. And it still was, got it was, a good story out yeah, of it. Yeah, it was quite compelling. Yeah. I wanted uh, to know what I guess the creepy thing he was going to do next. Yeah, well, the, the temptation obviously usually is to tell so much more of the story rather than just to leave it sort of... I mean, because we had to think about it afterwards. OK, what was that about? Which yeah. is mm. probably well, a good way to leave an audience. Well, certainly none of us would have thought at any stage that he was the beautiful girl. No, no, no. no. And it was that... I think we all have those memories of getting home from school. It, it's sort of this space between school and his home life, which was obviously a fairly... Yeah, and I guess I just kept thinking about, you know, when, as, as it, when you're at school, you, you usually have a crush on someone, and so yeah. I thought that's where it yes. was going. So it yes. was a, it was it's an a interesting script. Letter, and, and look, as a director, it's really hard to tell a, a really good story in two minutes, and I think mm. they did that mm. pretty well, as mm. creepily strange as it was. <laughs> <laughs> so Ethan Scott, unusual, yes. but we liked it. Yeah, well done. <laughs> keep, keep, up, keep up the good work. So you can find the link to that short film, Beautiful Girl, on our website. All right, before we leave, Daryl, is there any other projects coming up? Yeah, I've got a, uh, I've got a few. I guess uh, one I talked about earlier, Long Shadows. Um, mm. Josh McWilliams, one of the leads in that, and Linda Miller. Um, so we'll be shooting the trailer in June yep. um, over probably two weekends, and then the feature probably will be shooting around about November or December uh, next year. Uh, I've also just been brought on as a producer for another film uh, called Thicker Than Water, um, we've got a couple of really good uh, lead actors in that that I can't name yet because they haven't been confirmed, but we're, we're pretty sure we've got them. Well, so I'm uh, available, by the yeah. way. <laughs> so that was uh, written by Ali Popov and uh, Madeline Kennedy. So uh, looking forward to that one. That again will be towards the end of the year. And I'm also a uh, lead in a film called Blind Eye, which is a vigilante superhero, which is pretty good for a fat 45-year-old guy. I'm a <laughs> 49-year-old guy. Um, so I, I'm looking forward to that because there's quite a bit of uh, bit of action in that one. So I wish I had Ghost Dog with Forrest Whitaker. Yeah, yeah. So looking forward to that. Uh, I've also, I'm also running the Brisbane Actors Community Group on Facebook and I've just started Australian uh, Actors Community Group. So, and in fact, I only started that yesterday. So that's just to get a little bit more interest from other states and so see what's going on. you a slacker, it sounds like. Pretty much. You don't I, have a lot going on. No, I try to, uh, you know, in between looking after the four kids and working. Yeah. <laughs> Not much on, really. <laughs> well, it's been great to have you on the show. And Pleasure. viewers, check out our website and our Facebook, Twitter and YouTube pages. And please continue to donate to our Indiegogo crowdfunding campaign because we really do need your support and it's greatly appreciated. We'll see you next week. Until then, bye for now.